All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in this Mark II Jaguar XF. The first generation Jaguar XF ran from 2008 until 2015, and it was a bold move for Jaguar. It was a big departure from the Fuddy Duddy S type, which it replaced, which I always like, to be honest, but anyway, I'll leave that for another video. It was the first Jag for a while, which embraced the future rather than romanticizing ideas from the past. It's fair to say it was a big success. A great success! They sold lots of them and they were very popular. So this second generation XF had to be good. And it is. It's not perfect, no, but it's a very worthy successor. Jaguar have done a very good job in recent years of, of attracting a younger and more varied audience. In fact, I'd go as far as to say I don't think Jaguar make a bad looking car at the moment. And you often see various E-paces and F-paces and I-paces and stuff on the roads, and they're all driven by generally younger people. So they've definitely blown the cobwebs off the Jags of old, and slowly but surely Jaguar are shedding that image of them only being popular amongst older golfers and Freemasons. If you get a nice R Sport model with nice wheels and a good colour, they're as good looking as any M Sport BMW or Black Edition Audi. They really are very sporty looking. They also look very menacing, which I think is crucial for any good Jag. Jags have always had this roguish image, and I know that's been referenced many times in the Grand Tour and Top Gear over the years, but it's true. If you see a Jaguar parked up outside the post office, it should make you think, hmm, that's either an old chap in there with chinos and a Panama hat sending a letter to his daughter in New Zealand, or it's somebody with a sawn off holding the place up. And I think the new XF does that job perfectly. They appeal to both audiences, which is quite a difficult thing to do. In addition to all the R Sport models, which look very athletic and fresh and sporty, they also offer it in full on Werther's spec so as not to alienate the, the Chino and Panama Brigade. This 2016 model I'm in today is a fine example of that. The outside colour, I guess you'd call it oxblood or something, it's a colour that you'd only see on an old Chesterfield. The inside is beige, obviously, and the pattern on the beige leather seats is reminiscent of an old pair of golf shoes, so it'll certainly appeal to the older gentleman. The spec of this particular model is a little bit strange. The shape and tech is cutting edge, but the colour and spec will appeal to those who still remember ration books. It would be a bit like the designers of the Shard in London hiring my grandmother to do the decor. So what's it like to drive, I hear you ask? Well, it's actually pretty good, just like its predecessor. The BMW 5 Series pips it to the post handling-wise, but I would say it's definitely, definitely second. It's a very close runner-up. It's way better than the E-Class, the Audi A6 and the Lexus GS. It's really quite engaging to drive, and even though I've only got a four-cylinder turbo diesel engine under the bonnet, which produces 180 horsepower, there's really plenty of get up and go. Yeah, I'm already doing, I shan't tell you the speed, but I'm already doing at A speed, which is quite impressive. They offer various different engine choices, which I'll get onto shortly, but the 180 horsepower diesel model, which is that new Ingenium motor, is pretty good. It's, it's well, it's all the engine you'd ever need, really. But yeah, handling wise, it really is very good. The steering's perfect, it's very precise. It's just quite engaging to drive. Obviously, the power is sent to the rear wheels, as it should be, but it's very comfortable. It's not a rock-hard M Sport BMW. It's fun and rewarding when you want it to be, but then when you don't, it's just a perfectly comfortable cruiser. Exactly what an XF should be. The ride isn't too firm, thanks to its adaptive suspension. You've got these various different driving modes here, so right now I'm just in normal mode. If I select dynamic, all the dash all turns red, which makes it feel quite sporty. The electric power steering stiffens up slightly, and it becomes slightly stiffer, but it's still not uncomfortable. You can also slide it over to Eco, which slows everything down. Just means that you've got to be quite heavy footed with the accelerator to move. Styling wise, I think it's a great looking car. It's sharper and more purposeful than the previous XF, but it's still not too vulgar or blingy. It's still quite conservative. It looks like a bigger XE, which is no bad thing. I think the XE is a good looking car, but I think the XF is better looking because the rear end of the XE, when you look at it from the side profile, the rear end of the XC is a little bit stubby, whereas this, with a slightly longer boot, just works. It's just a, the proportions are just better. This Mark II XF is marginally shorter and lower than the previous model, but it's not enough to notice. It's also got a slightly longer wheelbase, which translates to more interior space. That also means you get a bigger boot than the previous XF. Inside feels lighter and brighter than the previous XF, and that's all thanks to the windows, because the windows on this XF are slightly bigger, which lets in more light. There's lots of room up front, there's lots of headroom, there's plenty of room in the back too, so even if you're six foot something, there is plenty of space in the back, which you wouldn't necessarily expect on quite a, a curvy saloon car. So they've done a good job there. After driving this for a couple of days, I have found one quite annoying blind spot, and it's there on the passenger side B pillar. If you're pulling out of a side road onto a main road and you want to look left over your shoulder, 
the B pillar there combined with the passenger, side, uh, passenger seat headrest are right in your line of sight, which is a little bit dangerous. So you find yourself really having to, to lean so you don't take out a passing cyclist. Although the boots are very good size, bigger than some of the competition, if you get down on your hands and knees and look up, they haven't bothered painting or insulating or carpeting the top of the boot. So all you get is just some unpainted metal, which is a little bit cheap looking. I've noticed the same thing on an XE that I've got in stock. I thought that might just be unique to Jaguar trying to save the pennies, but we've got an E-Class in the showroom at work and that's exactly the same. Which when you're spending nearly 40,000 pounds on a car, you'd expect that to be finished better. The body on this XF is stiffer than the previous model, which really does help the handling. Makes it feel much more precise and sure-footed. And it's almost 200 kilograms lighter than the previous model and it's more aerodynamic which will save you some money at the fuel pumps because it's much better on fuel than the previous XF. In addition to that saving, if you go for this 2 litre diesel, that's almost 80 kilograms lighter than anything from the competition. While I'm on the subject of this new lightweight engine, it's available in various stages of tune. So it's offered with 163 horsepower, 180 horsepower, or they do a twin turbo version, which puts out 240. So there's something for everybody. In my opinion, you're better off with this 180 horsepower because it's pretty good at most things and for every day just pottering around. It's pretty good. They also offer a 3 litre TDV6 which is available in the XFS, which if I was on the hunt for an XF, that's probably the one I would go for, although that doesn't really make any sense, but then most of my decisions don't. There are also two turbocharged petrol offerings which produce 250 horsepower or 300 horsepower. If you opt for one of those petrol engines though, obviously your MPG figures will take a hit. They'll probably halve realistically. So for most people, this 180 horsepower model is all the engine that you'd need. It feels brisk, fuel economy is good, there's really not much negative to tell you about it. There is one thing actually, um, the more I drive these Ingenium engines, this is probably true of most small diesel engines, they don't sound the best. It's just not a very nice note is it? They have done well though with the soundproof in Jaguar because you can't hear too much engine noise. Sat here at 60 miles an hour apart from the horrible rain can't hear an awful lot of wind or road noise. They offer this XF with a six speed manual, but in reality, most people are gonna go for the automatic. It's an eight speed gearbox, which does a fairly good job. It's a little bit easily confused sometimes, particularly if you're slowing down to a roundabout and then you need to sort of accelerate quickly. It sometimes doesn't know which gear to give you, but generally for every day, you know, tooling around, it's pretty good. And typical of all drags of this sort of era, you get this rotary gear selector which pops up as soon as you press the start button. You could also buy the XF with all wheel drive, although that was only available in certain specs. So fuel wise, Jaguar claim that you'll get around 55 miles per gallon around town and 65 miles per gallon on a motorway run. Now in reality, I've been getting around 43 miles per gallon around town and 53 miles per gallon on a run. So they're still pretty good figures, but just not quite as high as Jaguar suggest. What's also impressive on this XF is the very low CO2 emission figure. It's low enough that even Emma Thompson would approve. That low CO2 figure means that you only have to give 30 of your Great British Pounds to HMRC in exchange for 12 months road tax, which is always quite a nice feeling. Now inside this Model XF, truthfully, it's just less, less special than the first generation XF. I remember getting in the previous Model XF for the first time and it was, it had the wow factor and this, this doesn't really. It's very nice, don't get me wrong, but it's just not as, not as upmarket and as, as impressive as the first one. I know that this is only quite a low spec prestige model, so I can't criticise it too badly because if you go for a portfolio or an R-Sport, it will be nicely finished. But I mean, here where you'd expect leather, you just get textured plastic. And similar to the XF, the rubber dials around the gear selector and the volume control are like the rubber that you'd find in a cheap Casio wristwatch. The steering wheel controls feel plasticky and hollow, it's just not quite what you'd expect for a, a premium car. Having said all that, you do get some nice options as standard. So it comes with heated seats. You get JLR's new infotainment screen there, which is very easy to use. All the buttons and switch gear though do feel quite solid and robust. The actual build quality feels very good. There are a lot of features there that aren't standard. So for example, you don't get powerful mirrors. The seats aren't electrically operated, so you have to pump it up or pump it down manually. It's a bit like being in a Ford Focus, you'd expect better from a Jag. I know that's true of any 5 Series or E-Class as well, unless you spec the top model. They do cheap out on certain areas. But that would put your average Jagman off. I mean, Henry Blofeld isn't going to like that. 
I think overall the interior, although it's very well built, just isn't as impressive as the previous model. The air vents here in the middle are fixed, whereas on the previous XF, when you started it, they would just rotate and reveal themselves. The far left and right ones still do that, but the centre ones are fixed. It's just slightly less theatre with this model. Everything's quite nicely laid out though. You've got a couple of cup holders, you've got a nice soft leather armrest, and under that is a USB and auxiliary point. As you drive it, there aren't any rattles or creaks, so I've got no issues with build quality. Everything feels really solid and well screwed together. So you would hope that it would stand the test of time. I mean, these Ingenium engines, for example, they're chain driven and they're featured in a whole host of cars like the new Evoque, the Discovery Sport. I've had lots of them now and I've never had any issues. Jaguar Land Rover recommend that you change the oil every 20,000 miles, which I wouldn't do personally. I wouldn't leave it longer than 10, but that's what they recommend. This particular model has only done 31,000 miles and it doesn't feel any different to the, the XE that I've got in stock that's done 83,000 miles. So I think, like anything, if you maintain them, they'll last. I have heard of a couple of issues though with the instrument cluster that can occasionally go blank, but I think that's a recall by Jaguar. I think it's some sort of software update. So if that happens to you, give them a call. I think overall though, in recent years, Jaguars are getting more reliable, which if you're in the market for one, should be quite reassuring to hear. Used prices here in the UK for the Mark II XF start at a very tempting 11,000 pounds. Now for one like this, this is a 2016 Prestige, with 31,000 miles on the clock and good service history, that'll set you back around 15,000 pounds. They just look like good value to me. Because in my mind, they're still a modern car. If you want the all singing, all dancing TDV6, which is the model I personally would go for, they start at around 18,000 pounds. You can also buy the second gen XF as an estate, which I think are very good looking cars. So if you're in the market for a used Jaguar XF, make sure it's got good service records, make sure there aren't any warning lights on the dash. You can't really go wrong. There's lots of choice on the used market, so I guarantee you'll find the colour and spec that you want. I'd also recommend going for a more youthful colour combination, to be honest, rather than this Bowls Club Captain model. So it doesn't matter if your name's Richard Whiteley or Richard Madden, there's definitely an XF out there for you. Yep. So thanks once again for watching, make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below, and I'll do my best to get back to you. So yeah, cheers guys, I'll see you next time.